most avid reader by Bibi Berkey. family is asleep. I know you're awake. People like you don't like sleeping. You're right. And why don't you sleep? When I was little, my dad used to let me into his study just before dinner time. I could choose a book from his huge library and bring it to him, and we'd talk about it. I was very young, and the extent of my contribution was usually about the cover illustration but I sensed how reverentially he held these items that meant little to me. Perhaps one day you'll be a writer, eh? he'd say. And in time I learnt to answer, yes, yes, I will. I grew up like that, in love with his idea of what I could be. I pinned everything to it. I behaved in the way I thought an intellectual should behave, not arrogantly, I hope, but just self-assured. Higher education was my way in, I felt. And then it just ended, so easily. And the rest has been an important exercise in recovery and growth. You didn't end my writing career. You merely demonstrated how flimsy the dream was. It wasn't even my dream, just my father's idle imagination. Where would I be now if I were a successful writer? My eyes fill with tears over a family that might never have been. I wrote a story, my own story and peopled it with my loved ones. It will continue until my dying day, but no one's going to read it. Only I shall know the text, and that satisfies me. That's the only masterpiece that's ever coming from my hands. But Monica, you are persuasive. Not because you offer me money or work, but because you know what drives me. I can't rest if I don't tell stories. It may be that you're the only means for me to let them out. I'm crammed full, painfully full, with plot lines, with beautiful meetings and tearing losses, with shocks and surprises and friends and enemies. I can't keep them in. I want them read and I will write them and give them to you. You can pay me if you want, I don't care, but I'll write them. Perhaps not on your terms, but I will write them. Go ahead. You are the writer, not me. The Women in the Woods, the final chapter. For six days, Dominic sat at his window while the household slept and looked out across the lawn and beyond to the fields and woods of Hindwald. For three of those days, he had Mariah. It was treachery that had made her run away from him, the lure of an anonymous life in London. He'd given her tools to make her way on her own, and she'd snatch them up and run from him, laughing as she went. On the fourth day he felt a sudden terror, and it eclipsed his resentment. What if she'd been kidnapped, or assaulted, attacked by someone who wanted her for himself? Not far from Clement Street, seamier London pulsed and threatened. Then last night the fifth night of her absence, a profound sorrow had set in. She wasn't coming back. The future was set. He was leaving for his father's old school in the new year. Then, when his education ended, he would return to run the estate, and that would take up his life. Her memory would ebb from him. Mariah who had owned his past, now vacated his future. In his dreams he was back in Fair Spinney, the little circle of woodland where he'd first spied the Hesiods. 
He stood in the centre of a clearing, entirely naked, while all around him the women laughed and pointed. The Hesiod children skipped around and jeered, and in the meantime he'd begged for someone to cover him up, and cried out for permission to leave. Finally, his Mariah emerged from the crowd and approached him with an enigmatic expression on her face. As she did so, she loosened her hair and it fell enormously to her feet. She used it to cover his body, singing and humming to herself as she arranged it. He felt, even in his sleep, the cold of her skin as her hands busied themselves over his shivering body. He felt, in his dream, as she must have felt when those prodding fingers arranged her hair and tied a ribbon round her neck, a doll, a pet. For six nights, Mariah had been on the move. She'd walked to the docks and watched the ships leaving down the Thames, heading out into open water, the wider world. She'd been conscious of a hankering. For what? To be leaving on those ships? For her old world? For him? What she knew was that she and Dominic would never be allowed to stay together and that he was a fool if he thought they could. The more they grew to love each other, the greater the tragedy around the corner for both. She wasn't going to endure that kind of pain, however much he might. But nor was she planning to pursue the hypnotically aimless life of the Hesiods. Any decision made about her future would be her own. And yet her feet brought her back north. She wanted to see Hindwald once more, embrace her sisters, perhaps witness the birth of her new sibling, share her mother's delight, but she would never see Dominic again, certainly not allow him to catch sight of her, for both their sakes. She sold the gifts that the Hadley girls had given her to pay for her meagre food and to secure her passage by coach on one stretch of her journey. By the sixth night, she was a mile from Hindwald, crossing the southernmost fields, skirting Fair Spinney and approaching her mother's encampment. As she walked, she marvelled at the strange pulsing light on the horizon, like moving fires or bobbing torches. It seemed to draw her home, that shimmering streak of gold. Arriving finally at the Hesiod's huts, she saw her mother sitting by a campfire with Nathan Gentle. The two of them huddled together. She didn't want to disturb them. Instead, she sneaked into the hut without being noticed and climbed into bed with her younger sister and settled herself with the delicious thought that after six wearying days of travel, she could sleep deeply and lengthily at last. On the sixth night, Dominic sat at his window and saw to the east campfires outside the Hesiod's huts. Gentle would be down there, among them, accepted into their tribe, the father of an imminent new member. He would be holding Elizabeth to him to protect her from the cold air, and he would be satisfied with his lot. Even further to the east, maybe half an acre's width away, he made out more lights. But these were moving. Dominic didn't care to understand what they were. Certainly couldn't have known that his Mariah had also been captivated by their strange energy. They were probably the lamps on a row of carts going home to Louth. Except they were not going towards Louth. They were heading this way. The lights were massed in a rectangle and glimmering and jiggling with the suggestion of movement. They were somewhere near the boundary of the east field, about a quarter of a mile from the Hesiod huts. The boy observed them with wonder, as though he were seeing a procession of fairies abroad on a spring night. 
but the wonder wore off, as it dawned on him as though they should not be there, encroaching on his father's land. Those lights denoted a large number of people. There was something unpredictable and increasingly ominous about them as they progressed across the east field. Where was Nathan? He must rouse Nathan. Dominic leapt from window recess and rushed from his bedroom and down the great stone steps that ended at the front door of Hindwald House. Beneath his hand, the child shifted. His mother's skin undulated and Nathan Gentle, his palm on Elizabeth's abdomen, was shocked by the boldness of an unborn child, by its insistence on attention, even from the womb. He felt that familiar need rising in him, to confirm that the child was his. Always it rang distantly in his mind, the alarm of doubt, but he wouldn't give in to it. What did it matter? His role was to protect mother and child, particularly if it turned out to be a boy. And even those thoughts he dismissed at once, the vile rumours, He knew these women by now. They were gentle, peaceful and loving. They were excited about their pregnancies, enjoyed lugging the weight of an extra human around inside them. And so, again, he stilled his heart and sat with Elizabeth under a dizzying sky of stars on an unusually warm November night, holding her to him. Behind them, In the dozen or so huts, the Hesiot women and children slept after a long day of labour. It fascinated him to see that glow of light to the east. He watched it dreamily at first, but an uneasiness was growing. The illumination of the woods beyond the boundary edge was ceasing to be reassuring. It became sinister. A satanic brightness, sir fiery moving glow that lit the trees from below and created out of the woods a kind of overlit room, a suffocating, wavering place of flickering shadows. It was accompanied by the growl of lowered voices, angry muttering, whipping itself up into a state of aggression. Nathan leapt to his feet, He calculated that it would take a further five minutes for the mob to arrive. Would that be enough to evacuate the Hesiod huts? Or would it be safer for the women if he were to stand between them and the crowd, to use all his authority to appease the new arrivals and to persuade them to turn back? Nathan, they're coming! He turned to see Dominic limping breathlessly towards him. The lad had sprinted from Hindwald House. Master Dominic, run back to the big house and get help. Wake the servants first. We need no less than your father here. But we need a show of strength too. Wake the stable boys. Do what you can, but hurry. Dominic hesitated. He felt sick at the sight of the expression on Nathan's face and on the puzzled features of Elizabeth who sat at his feet. She still had one hand in Gentle's, and now she tightened her grip and pulled herself up. Nathan, she asked. All is well, love. Go inside and close your door. But she didn't move. He turned to Dominic. Thou must go, he urged the quivering boy. Now, lad. And with that, Dominic turned and fled. At the head of the mob of around 40 people, mostly men, but with a few older women among their number, was Nicholas Rouse, Dominic's sacked tutor. Nathan watched them spill over the wooden fence and pour into the field and head towards them. As his eyes met Rouse's, he saw the tutor raise a hand to halt the crowd. They were about 30 yards away from Nathan and half that distance from the most outlying hut. They nearly all of them carried torches and their faces stood out like white masks against the depths of the night. 
It's not right, called Rouse, his voice high with excitement. What happened to these people here? They were thrown out for no good reason. Nathan had an urge to hush Rouse up, to make him lower his voice in deference to the sleeping households. No, it weren't right, he said. But you've got to ask yourself, who is it that carries the blame? It ain't these women here. Damn it, but they ain't even speaking God's English, let alone making decisions about who lives where. A voice from the mob pierced the flickering air between them. They never said nay. And the crowd of people, as though one, repeated the assertion with rising bitterness. It ain't their fault, repeated Nathan. For pity's sake, their bairns sleeping there. Leave them in peace and let us march to the big house and have your voices heard there. I would gladly come with thee. A woman stepped from the mob. Nathan recognised her as Helen Wentworth. She'd given five of her sons to service for the Hadleys and worked her own hands raw at harvest time. Her children had been born in one of those labourers' cottages, just visible in the gloom, and she'd probably expected to die there. They stand empty, our homes. Why? We did nothing to vex no one. But then these witches came and charmed the master away, and we're left to starve. I ain't saying that Hadley ain't guilty, but these harpies are and all. Nathan shook his head, raised a hand towards her as though he wished to soothe her with his touch. No, Helen, no. These women don't know what's what. They were told to come here, and they done it. That's all. They're innocent. Your business is with Hadley, and I shall take thee there. Come with me now. What do you care? claimed an anonymous voice. You've done all right out of it. Nicholas Rouse came closer. Gentle's comradeship was not fooling him. Their history was one of distrust and animosity. Why would it change now? You go now, called Gentle, and I won't say a word to anyone. You stay any longer and you might end up in trouble. He raised his voice and addressed them all. You hear me, everyone? Anything hot-headed goes on here tonight and you end up transported if you're lucky. And what's the point of risking a hang-in, eh? Inside one of the Hesiod huts, a child was crying and a mother was starting to gabble nervously in her language. We ain't got anything anyhow, spoke Helen Wentworth again. We die of hunger or die on the gallows, what do we care on it? And at that a young man broke away from the burning mass of seething people and ran at the outlying hut. He elbowed the wooden shutters open and threw in his torch. No! yelled Nathan and ran forward, only to be caught and wrestled to the ground by Rouse and three others. As his head was kicked and jostled, he saw Daniel Harrop among the crowd of former Hindwald employees, a man no better than a thug, and a thick rope hung in loops from his arm. Don't touch her. Leave her be, or by God I'll kill you. These were Nathan's last words before he was kicked viciously in the back of his head by a steel-capped boot. The blood flowed, and Elizabeth, who had witnessed the hatred in the faces around her but understood nothing of their business, screamed at the sight of it. But before that scream had even left her, her arms were pinned behind her and the noose placed around her neck. All about her resounded the words child killer, witch, traitor. She understood not a syllable. Dominic Hadley was arriving with Jem Norton and Mark Bainbridge, the stable lads, as the third hut was being set on fire. 
they entered a scene of wildness, horror and confusion. People running, people standing and watching, the air crackling with flames. Women and children were screaming and dashing from their homes. Men with torches were battering at the doors of the huts or climbing onto their roofs. It was a scene of hellfire, with terrified faces hurtling past him and other faces twisted into an agony of pleasure. Watching from a devil-possessed crowd in the centre, Nathan lay in his own blood. Stop! cried the boy. Stop in the name of John Hadley! As though that would halt the carnage, as though he could be heard, as though anyone at all cared for authority any more. Then he saw her. A woman struggling, clutching wildly at a rope attached to her neck, the other end had been slung over a bow and a party of men were just about to heave on it and draw her up. Elizabeth's eyes were wild, her lips distorted. Sweet, funny, docile Elizabeth. The sight was perverse, revolting. Dominic was unable to move. But in that second of fear and indecision, an explosion rang out that was even louder than the crackling fires and the screams. It was a gun. Mrs Hadley had the old family musket. One of her eyes was still shut from peering through its sight. Slowly she raised her chin while holding the weapon in place. It would need refilling if she was to inflict lasting harm on anyone, but she could sense that she had already achieved much. Because the men who had placed the noose around Elizabeth's neck seemed to be shocked awake. In that moment they seemed sickened by what they were attempting and dropped the rope and ran. Those who had set the huts alight suddenly woke to the screams of the women inside. Their nerves failed them and they also fled. Mr Hadley was now arriving with the rest of the male household. Mrs Hadley screamed at the departing mob. That's right, run. I know who you all are. You will hang, all of you. She dropped the musket and grabbed for one of the guns being held by her footman and placed it at her shoulder, shooting into the night, hoping to have dispatched at least one of the trespassers. With that, she handed back the weapon and fell to action. Fetch water, she cried. Pails, as many as you can get. The maids, footmen, gamekeepers and stable boys who had arrived were now running back to fetch water. The scene of mayhem turned into a frenzy of desperate industry. Dominic watched as his mother strode over to the tree where Elizabeth sat slumped on the ground and put out an arm. Come, she commanded. We need all the help we can muster. The Hesiod leader looked up and took the hand of the mistress of Hindwold. She got to her feet, and understood exactly that she was needed. In that moment, the beam holding her own hut gave way, and the structure collapsed, embers shooting every which way through the night air. All three of Elizabeth's daughters were found dead in the remains of the house. Because of the way the fire had consumed the building, travelling along the main roof beams first, the flames had never reached the girls, but instead they'd been overcome by the smoke. Too frightened to leave their bed and enter the mayhem outside their front door. The two younger ones were discovered, huddling in the arms of their older sister. The one recently christened Mariah. The Hesiots buried their dead in Fair Spinney, with Mrs Hadley's approval. She watched the women scratch shallow trenches at the foot of certain trees, and when the bodies had been placed in the hollows and covered over with the meagre, dusty forest soil and leaves, she came and stood by Elizabeth for a few moments. They didn't touch, didn't speak, couldn't understand each other anyhow, they would leave each other in peace from now on. 
The fight was over. Mrs Hadley had work to do in any case and left to oversee the arrangements for the funeral of her husband's farm manager, Nathan Gentle. From the top of the incline, where Dominic had once spied the beautiful Hesiod leader sunning herself in a clearing down below, and had once been accosted by her daughter, he watched the burials taking place. He forced himself to look when the body of Mariah, clothed in immaculately clean white linen, was placed by three pregnant women in a trench at the foot of a sapling. She was covered over by a large square of carpet, and then the earth was pushed on top of her. This is the end of our story, he thought. He watched the leaves and sticks and soils being shoved over the mound by the careless feet of the Hesiod women, and wondered why he'd thought there was anything enchanting or beautiful about them in the first place. They deserved their fate of obscurity, these women. They were nothing. And Mariah was nothing. And so his story with her was right to end. His dreams, too, would be ending now, and the voice in the night would be silenced. Our history is written, he said, and there is nothing more to write. He turned his back on the women who grubbed about the earth clumsily, arranging over the sisters' decayed leaves and worm casts, bark and dust. There is not one word more about us left to write. Hillary was played by Rebecca Charles, Monica by Georgina Sutton. The male narrator was Mark Lingwood. Your Most Avid Reader was written by Bibi Berkey with sound editing by Mark Lingwood. It was made by Tempest Productions and brought to you with the kind support of Rattlesnake Books an established seller of books, maps, ephemera, art and curiosities. Rattlesnake Books can be found on Instagram, Etsy, Abe Books and Biblio. Thank you.